During the one-day visit, which saw President Tsisi hold talks with his Kenyan counterpart Uhuru Kenyatta, the two leaders agreed to remove double taxation on imports in a bid to improve bilateral trade. At a joint press conference with Kenyatta in Nairobi, President Tsisi said that Egypt is seeking to boost trade and investment cooperation between the two sides. The president also hailed the developing cooperation between the private sectors of both countries over the past few years. The president also noted that the first joint business council, which convened in Nairobi a few days ago, had agreed on fostering trade cooperation in various domains. What were the most important outcomes of the visit? How significant was President Sisi's visit to Nairobi? And how does my guest evaluate Egyptian-Kenyan ties as a whole and economic ties in particular? That's what we're going to be taking a look at during the first half of the program. Later on in the hour, we'll be taking a look at the outcomes of a tripartite meeting that is taking place today in Tunisia uh, between Egypt, Tunisia and Algeria over solving the Libyan crisis. The meeting, which was supposed to be held on March the 1st, tackled the results of the consultations that the three countries conducted with the Libyan factions to reach a convergence of views between them. How important was this meeting? Why was it moved forward? How does my guest evaluate? the status quo in Libya that and much more will be looked at today as well but as always there are other top stories making headlines here in the country that we like to shed light on and we'll be beginning with President Abdel Fattah his Sisi who asserted today on the necessity of reaching a just and comprehensive solution to the Palestinian cause which puts a permanent end to the Palestinian Israeli conflict President Sisi stated that achieving peace in the region will pave the way for achieving economic and social development and will also contribute to combating terrorism and eradicating terrorist organizations. The president's statements came during a meeting with a delegation of the heads of American Jewish organizations, which was attended by head of intelligence Khaled Fawzi. Presidential spokesman Ambassador Ali Youssef said that the president was keen on meeting with different sections of American society in order to bolster mutual communication and understanding of the nature of the challenges that face the region and the means of facing these challenges. During the meeting, the president also stressed that Egyptian-American ties are strategic and extended, adding that the upcoming period will witness an overall enhancement in all fields. The president also stated that Egypt is on the right track to achieving comprehensive economic development. For their part, the delegation expressed their appreciation appreciation of Egypt's leadership and people, hailing the country's pivotal role in the Middle East peace process. Professor Linguistics and Political Science Dr. Hassan Wagi joins us now over the phone to tell us more about how he sees this visit by the American Jewish delegation and their meeting with the President. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, uh, Dr. Hassan, how do you evaluate today's meeting between the President and, as I mentioned earlier, the American Jewish delegation? Actually, it is the framework of the strategic relationship between Egypt and the United States. And um, uh, it is very needed uh, to have uh, discussions and dialogue and negotiation with all the involved with, uh, people in the peace process. Uh, because if we are looking at the, the whole issue of war and terror and some other wars, I think the Palestinian-Israeli conflict is in the middle of it. And I think that instead of talking about uh, Islamic terrorism and uh, all these misnomers for the crises, I think the main point is to reach uh, a settlement and stability and economic growth. In, in the area, and instead of getting into war, this is for the benefit of all the people who are living in this area. So uh, the president and his meeting today with the community, Jewish community in the United States, is very important in, in getting uh, things settled and in getting um, atmosphere uh, ready for uh, a serious round of negotiation that would lead to uh, an agreement on the two state principle because this is very important principle and agreed upon by all the parties a long time ago and it should end that way. I wanted to ask you how you view the um, the future of a two state solution under 
a Trump administration. Uh, what's your question again, please? I wanted to know how you see the future of a two-state solution under a Trump administration. I think uh, there, could, there could be some problems as it used to be, but I hope that uh, President Trump uh, will be understanding to the inevitability uh, of peace when he pursues uh, an avenue for a state, uh, two-state solution, because this is the only avenue that would lead to real stability and real cooperation between all the parties in the area. Okay, I thank you very much, Dr. Yeah. Hassan Wagi, Professor of Linguistics and Political Science. Uh, today, we also saw Minister of State for Military Production, Mahmoud Al Asar, head to the uh, United Arab Emirates to Abu Dhabi in particular to attend the inauguration of the 13th International Defense Exhibition and conference the IDEX. The IDEX 2017 will be held from February the 19th and through to the 23rd at the Abu Dhabi National Exhibition Center. And this is the first time that the Ministry of Military Production has taken part in the exhibition. At least 1,300 companies from 28 countries, including Australia, Austria, Belarus, the Czech Republic, France, Germany and South Korea, as well as other nations will take part in the event. The IDEX is the most strategically important tri-service uh, defense exhibition in the world as year on year it attracts a growing wealth of international decision makers from within the defense industry alongside key representatives from governments, armed forces as well as key military personnel. Now on the sidelines of the exhibition, Minister Al Asar met with the Vice President of the UAE, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, during which they presented the capabilities of the Ministry of military production. Al Asar also received the Russian Minister of Trade and Industry and they discussed means of bilateral cooperation between Egypt and Russia. Ladies and gentlemen, our first report for the evening and a closer look at President Abdel Fattah Sisi's one day visit to Kenya and then we'll be back to discuss that. Stay with us. President Afetah Sisi met with Kenyan counterpart Rukiniata in Nairobi on Saturday during a one-day visit to the country for talks on bolstering development projects between Nile-basin countries. During a press conference with Kenyatta, President Sisi said that Egypt will not spare any effort in bolstering its strategic relationship with Kenya in all aspects, especially in the area of development. He stated that Egypt and Kenya are connected by a single artery, the River Nile as well as a long history of constructive cooperation, adding that the two countries share the same hopes and aspirations as they both seek economic development and prosperity. The Egyptian leader reiterated that he agreed with Kenyatta that development efforts should be undertaken in all Nile Basin countries to make the most out of this vital artery. The Nile Basin countries are Egypt, Kenya, Ethiopia, Rwanda, Burundi, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Tanzania, Uganda, South Sudan and Sudan. The Egyptian president said that the talks with his Kenya counterpart revolved around ways of strengthening the economic and commercial relationship between the two countries to fulfill their mutual interests. President Sisi also said that the two leaders agreed on intensifying efforts to restore stability in East Africa and the Horn of Africa. The president also noted that the first joint business council convened in Nairobi a few days ago and agreed on fostering trade cooperation in various domains. He added that the Egyptian and Kenyan governments agreed to take needed measures to encourage trade exchange and establish joint projects. Moreover, Sisi stressed that the Kenyan government has Egypt's full support in the fight against the phenomenon of terrorism, adding that Egypt is determined to strengthen cooperation and coordination with Kenya in order to confront this danger, which has threatened the entire international community. He pointed to Al-Azhar Islamic Institution's role in the fight against extremist ideology, confirming that Al-Azhar is a beacon of moderate Islamic thought and obligation to spread the true religious ideas of Islam in order to confront extremist ideology. For his part, Kenyatta told reporters that the talks here were highly punctuated by need to boost economic relations. The Kenyan president added that terrorism and extremism 
represent the great danger in the world, stressing on the need to cooperate to get rid of this ideology by creating a program among the young people and by spreading the true teachings of Islam. The two sides also agreed to remove double taxation on imports in a bid to improve trade between the two countries. Kenya and Egypt have strong trade ties, with the total volume of trade between them standing at approximately $450 million in 2016. Egypt's culture has thousands of years of recorded history. In every major city, you will find traditions that remain from the time of the pharaohs. Cruising on the Nile. Ramadan in Egypt. Aid, and also shopping. Have a different flavor. Explore Egypt on Nile TV International. Explore Egypt. From Cairo to Alexandria. Sharm el Sheikh to Hergada. Try to descend the mystery of the Sphinx. Meditate on the cemetery of the pyramids. Explore incredible marine life in Marsala. Safaris into the desert of South Sinai. Relax with a view of the Nile. Explore Egypt on Nile TV International. to welcome here in the studio an engineer Abdel Nasser Tal. He is an economic expert and also the president of the International Federation of Real Estate uh, in the... Thank you very much Thank for joining us. Uh, let me start off by uh, asking you about your overall impressions of President Sisi's visit to Kenya. Uh, first of all, uh, it's, it's very vital that we now extend our strategic alliance to go to uh, African countries. It's, it's very vital during this, this phase. And uh, I think uh, this visit, uh, especially to Kenya, Kenya play uh, or is uh, located in a very strategic uh, location uh, in relation with Somalia and Ethiopia at the same time. So our presence in a strategic alliance there is, is extremely vital. I think opening direction not only at the political uh, level or, uh, or at the diplomatic level is not enough. It has to be extended to plans with the government for the private sector to be uh, in, in partnership with the government in this move. 
uh, to translate it into more economic and uh, 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 development uh, alliance. Mm. It's not only uh, at uh, the level of the diplomacy or at the level of political uh, uh, activities only. Okay, what were, do you think were the most important outcomes of this visit? Uh, I think uh, now uh, the, the Egyptian economy uh, and the experience we have here and uh, we can export a lot of goods and also a lot of services. Uh, we have a lot of experience, I'm talking about the, the real estate and development experience in Egypt can uh, easily be exported to a lot of, uh, a lot of African countries. Uh, I think also we need, uh, we need this in our economy and also uh, uh, not to make limitation on only some political uh, uh, support or mutual support between us and any other country. Mm -hmm. Did you see any particular significance to the timing of this visit? Uh, from the political side, I'm not aware about uh, right. the, 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 the actual situation, but I think uh, during what's happening in, in, uh, in our relation with Ethiopia and also with the new uh, formulas coming to Africa from many directions, especially uh, the new uh, American presidency and so, I think we have to extend more and more and to enhance our, uh, our relation with Africa very, very quickly. Um. When we look at the uh, areas of cooperation that currently exist between the two countries, what can you tell us about that and what can you tell us also about the new areas that we can tap into? Uh, still, I, uh, I, I don't know that we have uh, uh, a lot of uh, economic alliance or economic cooperation with, with Kenya. Um, I, know, I don't know a lot of information, but I am sure that the area where we can help and we can export and we can open channels of economy are extremely important for the Egyptian and also for other uh, African countries, especially Kenya. The location of Kenya is making it very important for Egypt at the time being. All right. When we um, talk about the visit, there was also a talk about the volume of trade exchange between uh, Egypt and Kenya and increasing it to top one billion uh, US dollars over the next two years. Uh, how important will this be? Uh, we need to, uh, to increase our exports. Right. We need to increase our sources of uh, foreign currency coming from outside and uh, a country like Kenya is uh, possibly and it's a very potential market to have uh, to play this game there. I think if we, we are existing in this kind of trading or cooperation at a level uh, we can double or triple this easily with this kind. Uh, the president Abbas, uh, Abdel Fattah Sisi is simply opening the direction but but now it's the role of the government and the private uh, sector to extend it to more. All right. How can the private sector, you've mentioned it in this at least twice now, the importance of the private sector in, uh, in improving perhaps economic relations with other countries, how can the private sector contribute uh, to or what areas rather can um, they um, invest in when it comes to looking at Kenya in particular? I think uh, that uh, a lot of Egyptian products are at the level of export uh, of exportation is, is is very good, but we are not exporting enough. But I'm talking about our sector, the real estate and construction business. We know that uh, some uh, few companies, few contractors moved to uh, to the African country and they did a very successful work there. Mm -hmm. And they have a very strong uh, uh, presence as well. I think other uh, companies, if we uh, provide for them a lot of facilitation in the uh, uh, and financing and so, and this is done by many uh, by many uh, countries. I extend their business in construction mm. to uh, the countries uh, going offshore by financial support. And the uh, banks in Egypt can give this financial support because the revenue from uh, the, the uh, foreign currency will be uh, much bigger for, for, for the Egyptian economy. This is the right time to move out to uh, African countries. Do you think, right, well, well, since you mentioned African countries and obviously expanding yes. when it comes to the real estate sector, um, how important can this be for the, for the industry in Egypt and also how will it benefit uh, these African countries in turn? Uh, the, the advantage of uh, exporting construction business uh, that the contractor does not go only to, uh, to collect a job and, and pay his, uh, his expenses. Uh, he pay, uh, he also 
is able to uh, import from Egypt a lot of construction materials. Mm -hmm. not, so it's not only for his salary. He's paying his salaries, big part of it in, in Egypt, in Egyptian pound, while he is getting his money for, uh, from, uh, f uh, with, with foreign currency from outside. So, and the presence of contractors specifically is uh, creating deep relations. Right. It is not a small size of trading with a small representative, representation. It's, it's a wide range of uh, services, products, and so on. And when he built his roots there, he is able to continue for years and years. This is not short-term uh, presence on, or investment. This is, and it creates good relation with, uh, with local uh, investors, local consultants, and so on. Right. And do you think with the liberalization of the pound that now Egypt is a more attractive market or, uh, for African countries? To uh, no, I think it's, uh, it gives to our product a better strength. Right. So uh, the prices of exporting uh, our, our uh, construction materials and so for, for us is making more benefit and more profit for, for us. It, we can easily export now. This is a golden time to export not to import. Right. Uh, I was also, um, during the visit, there was uh, an agreement to remove double taxation as well on imports. Um, what exactly does that mean and how exactly will that be beneficial? Uh, the double taxation on importing to Egypt? Yeah. Uh, this, this is a different issue, but I, uh, I think now this is liberalization not only at the, uh, at the, not at the, at the level of the currency only, uh, we have to open the market more and more. I know we are in a critical situation for the, after the devaluation of the dollar, but I think opening gradually, it will create more stability in the economy. We have to open our market more, uh, but, but carefully, not suddenly. We are in a, in a critical case in the uh, foreign currency issue. Right. When we talk about the, um, the visit, President Abdel Fattah Sisi also referred to the um, first joint business council uh, that convened in Nairobi a few days ago. How important is setting up business councils in other countries? Uh, I don't believe in, uh, in, in one action. I believe in committee and, uh, and continuous work. Uh, the president of a continuous uh, group of work uh, make this uh, kind of decision of direction uh, continue and alive. It is not only one shot, it is not only one visit. I think the participation of the private sector in such committees is, uh, is also required at this stage. Um, one of the points that the President mentioned also was um, restoring uh, stability and security to the East Africa and Horn of Africa areas. Now, how does security and stability have a direct effect on the economy? Uh, this area is very hot, close to Somalia, and uh, we know there are a lot of problems and troubles in Somalia. And uh, this is part of what we are facing in Egypt. Uh, and uh, at the same time, we are very uh, at the boundaries of, uh, of Ethiopia, and also we have to be present mm -hmm. uh, here and there. This uh, uh, Kenya carry a lot of resources, mm -hmm. and they need a lot of development. And uh, we can help Kenya too much in the development. The size of Kenya is half of the population of, uh, of Egypt. Their GDP per capita is very low uh, uh, to, a certain, to a certain level. I, I think it's, they need our presence and also we need to be present not only in Kenya. No. There is many, many points in Africa where our presence uh, will create a lot of benefit, not only political or security, but also economical. It's, uh, it's an open market for, uh, for the Egyptian from a different sector to, uh, to promote Egyptian products and to, uh, and to create mutual economical uh, benefits between us and these countries. Do you have any particular countries in mind when you advise, for example, or when you these are the areas in which, or these are the countries that we should be looking at? Yeah, some uh, uh, African countries are so uh, important, so big, and uh, economically are very important to create alliances with them. Mm -hmm. From our point of view, the uh, uh, South Africa and Nigeria play a, a major role in, the, uh, in Africa uh, globally. Uh, our presence with them in a kind of alliance, also economical alliance, mm. I think is, uh, will bring a lot of benefit uh, for, for Egypt and for these countries. Let me finally ask you about attracting African tourists. Obviously, tourism is a main pillar of the Egyptian economy and reviving the sector has been uh, something that we've been looking at and we, we've been trying to achieve here in the country. Can attracting African tourists also um, benefit the economy? 
to a large extent. I believe there is a lot of money, uh, wealthy people, uh, people looking for entertainment and tourism uh, in Africa, in all the countries. They are uh, not all, uh, all uh, uh, they, they need entertainment, they need uh, good climate for them, but uh, we are not reaching them. Right. The, uh, most of our economy is based on uh, uh, being present here and waiting people to come. We don't knock doors. We don't uh, promote our services, hotels and hospitality uh, to Africa. And also the f uh, uh, flights to Cairo has to be uh, not subsidized, but to be encouraged for charter uh, flights and mm -hmm. so on to facilitate uh, uh, restoring our relation uh, as, a, uh, as a transit hub. We have to play again this role. We have to be present at the col connection point as a trans the tr uh, transit hub for flight. This will bring automatically a lot of uh, tourists coming from uh, from Africa and from other places in the world. It's uh, it's it's important. Okay, I thank you very much, economic you. expert engineer Abdul Nasser Taha. Thank you for your time, ladies and gentlemen. Our second report for the evening sheds more light on the tripartite meeting that took place today in Tunisia with the attendance of the foreign ministers of Egypt, Algeria, as well as Tunisia to discuss the latest Libya crisis. A tripartite meeting between Egypt, Tunisia and Algeria to discuss resolving the Libyan crisis was scheduled to be held on Sunday instead of the 1st of March. In an official statement, the Tunisian ministry said that upon consultation with the Egyptian and Algerian foreign ministers, it was decided that the meeting hosted by Tunisia be brought forward. On Thursday, Foreign Minister Hamis Al-Ginawa announced Tunisia is set to host on the 1st of March a much-anticipated tripartite summit on the Libyan crisis. The meeting tackled the results of the consultations that three countries conducted with the Libyan factions to reach a convergence of views between them. It also laid the foundations of a consensual political solution to the crisis and created the conditions for the gathering of the Libyan parties to the dialogue table. Tunisian President Beji Qaid Sipsi will meet with the ministers afterwards on Monday and the three ministers will present the outcome of their meeting to him. Tunisia and Algeria will join Egypt in mediating between the Libyan sides to find a solution to the crisis. The Egyptian Arms Chief of Staff Mahmoud Hagazi, who was mediating talks between the Libyan factions on behalf of Cairo, received a delegation on Thursday from Libya's High Council of State. This was the latest visit by officials from Libya to discuss a way forward with Egyptian officials. Earlier this week, talks were held between the chairman of the Libyan Presidential Council, Faiz al-Saraj, who is based in the capital Tripoli in the west of the country and is recognized by the UN as the country's president and Field Marshal Khalifa Haftar, Parliament Speaker Gila Saleh, who both represent the House of Representatives in eastern Libya, Tobruk. Over the past months, Cairo has held meetings with different Libyan political factions where Egypt has stressed the need for a political consensus to end the crisis in the country. In December, Egyptian officials and representatives from multiple Libyan factions issued a declaration of principles and five proposed amendments to the Skairat Agreement during a meeting in Cairo. The December conference concluded by underscoring four main principles to be respected in Libya's transition the preservation of United Libyan territory, support for national institutions, non-interference by foreign bodies, and the maintaining of a civil state.
ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome back and allow me to welcome here in the studio Ambassador Nabil Badr, former Minister. Always a pleasure having you with us. Thank you very much for coming in. Thank you. And let me start off obviously by asking you today, there was a tripartite meeting to discuss the latest from the Libyan um, crisis. How do you think today's meeting went? I think it is important because uh, both three countries are interested. <coughs> For two countries, two of them as at least, as you know, mm. they have borders with Libya, Egypt on the eastern side, Tunisia on the western side as well, mm. and then in the African depth, of course, Algeria coincides with many important spots in that situation. Right. Libya is an extensive area, as you know, and with what has happened, things are not very clear. Mm. So, I think that the Tunisian uh, invitation to that meeting, as a matter of fact, represents that let's do something together, let's sort of come to a mutual better understanding about the future. The landmarks in, in that situation are important. Mm. You have, number one, the Libyan situation proper itself. What sort of factions, what sort of internal developments, what sort of uh, constituencies do really compose the Libyan internal scene in terms of local alignments, uh, conflicting interests in certain parts, or number three, the utilization as mm. has regrettably been obvious in certain parts of Libya of religion once more as the forefront for a political ambition in certain respects. And that has brought about the combination of all these factors. Uh, some odd voices that in certain times called for a separation between East, West and South. Right. While every party knows that it is in the best interest of Libya, its neighbors, and as a matter of fact, of an experiment as well to maintain the unity of Libyan proper in spite of these factors. Mm. Now, let me add as a factor number two, the Libyan position intimately does intervene in the internal, uh, not only welfare, but national security of neighboring countries. Right. Take for instance Egypt with borders extending for more than or approximately 1,200 kilometers. Mm -hmm. And they have been infiltrated uh, many times to smuggle weapons, to smuggle drugs, to smuggle whatever, uh, using this vast area for improper purposes. The same thing has happened on the Tunisian front, of course, shorter borders, but at the same time, that infiltration has been, properly speaking, behind right. uh, many of major terrorist actions that took place in Libya uh, in the last days. Then we come to Algeria, which is equally interested. It does not, of course, agree on these mishaps, but at the same time does maintain, or some of the Libyan factions do maintain with Algeria um, special relationships, if I might say so. Mm -hmm. Let me remind at that juncture of something. When you go back last century to 90s, right. we remember quite well that uh, there was uh, almost a revolution in, 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 in Algeria which brought about uh, a special rule and in which, which resulted consequently in a sort of a continuous conflict which took place between the Algerian uh, security armed forces and some of the terrorists or, you know, mm. uh, uh, other factions as well. Now, uh, Algeria, in looking at the Libyan position, probably in certain uh, moments, I think personally that it does reiterate uh, that sort of, uh, of, of mishap and probably wants to avoid it. Right. So the meaning of that tripartite meeting is let's join, put our heads together, that's number one. Mm. Uh, we have followed, and I'm sure that took place 
in the previous case on lots of occasions, but let's at that juncture look, put our heads together to come to a mutual better reading of each and every party's situation. That's number one. Right. Two, there was a very important development which took part recently, more uh, uh, explicitly, the meeting which took place here in Cairo mm. uh, between um, Mr. Al Safraj and Marshal uh, Hanifah. Uh, well, the, the commander chief of the uh, Libyan uh, uh, army, Khalifa. Yes, Haftar. Right. Haftar, mm. yes, I'm sorry. Um, and that was in itself really opening the door for lots of positive developments, right. uh, which should be held by all these parties to bring about the consequence. Let me say that, as you know, in Haftar's agreement, mm. Sarraj agreement in the Cairo meeting, the terms, broadly speaking, were um, a period in which elections should be prepared for to take place before February 80, to that the Libyan army under Marshal Khalifa Haftar mm. certainly had a responsibility to maintain Libyan security um, and Libyan good being and not really give a chance to terrorist factions which operate under different umbrellas mm. uh, because the situation internally is difficult and chaotic. Right. Uh, and, and, and three, of course, are dialogue between all the factions concerned. Right. Now, the help and of the three countries concerned, I think, is a great asset and very much required under the circumstances. Well, obviously, the, the meeting was uh, actually meant to be held on the 1st of March, but it was moved uh, forward. Uh, do you think there was a particular reason behind this? Yes, I think that, well, I mean, there, there have been certain speculations where that meeting is going to take place. Of course, I know that Tunisia has called for that meeting f It's now quite some time. Mm. Um, uh, but there were speculations that probably the health conditions of President Bouteflika might not be uh, helpful right. in uh, getting that meeting in Tunisia. So there were some ideas about whether that might take place or Algeria or not. Mm. But wherever this might take place, the significance is that now the ministers of foreign affairs have met. They have really studied thoroughly, as mm. is the case, all the dimensions of the problem. Now, the president's come to uh, endorse, give a strong political and moral support to what has been agreed upon. And actually, uh, that's very important because we have an important phase of follow-up of the consequences of the meeting and of what has taken place in Cairo as well, which certainly is a part and parcel uh, of the whole package being talked about. Right. And uh, that that itself sort of endorses. And then number two, sends a message to lots of international parties. Um, well, I'm sure you have followed quite closely yeah. all the international developments about the Libyan situation. There were lots of um, external unwanted interventions mm. for different reasons. Speculations extend from petrol, geopolitical interests, ambitions, uh, Mediterranean, let me say, overall uh, will to extend domination or mm. some regional more limited ambitions as well. Right. Now, one of the major cards which have been played, especially by Egypt and Libyan has called for that times and times again was, well, hands off, please. Hmm. We are going to deal with our own affairs. We are going to conduct our own dialogue. And we think, so said the Libyan, and so said Egypt and other Arab partners as well, especially in Tunisia and Algeria, that external intervention 
is far from being helpful under the existing circumstances. Right. So the meeting of the three presidents, I'm sure, would confirm that. And now, that's very much required. How do you get all the factions in Libya to put their personal interests aside and to really work on finding a solution to the conflict in the country? That's exactly the one million dollar question. Not that really it is impossible or it is hard to find, but we are seeking as well with the existing well-known differences a level of patriotism, mm. sacrifice, and concentration on the Libyan citizen best interest. Mm. What we have is so far is differences and the dividing lines are clear. Right. Some of them ideological, especially in the West. Mm. And these ideologies do extend from using Islam as a political weapon, mm. claiming to have an Islamic state, and in so doing, do not look as should be the case properly to the Libyan interest proper, and then with the same attitude do extend unwanted relations to partners that cannot really help Libya or help its welfare. That's number two. And number three, that some extremist strengths within these factions go astray up to the extent of being part and parcel of such notorious like Al-Qaeda or ISIS. And that's what we have seen in Libya. And what is regrettably up to this moment is in certain parts of Libya causing a lot of trouble. Right. That should be left relinquished. And they should be very clear about that. Mm. In other words, I, I think personally that I hope it's about time and that this time is not greatly overdue that these factions come out with a statement, a common statement or a common declaration stipulating that we ta, 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 do declare that Libya should remain independent, mm -hmm. should maintain its unity, should never be fractionalized or divided, mm -hmm. Three, and that we do not welcome external intervention. We are going to deal with our own affairs in our own way. I think if everyone comes deeply enough to that equation, things would be much better. The second thing is also a reason for that division is that some of these factions have resorted to military force. Right. In other words, they have turned uh, to bringing about their own so-called militias. And these so-called militias go around the town terrorizing peaceful citizens, stopping normal life, and occupying, as a matter of fact, some of the main uh, 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 main, 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 main means of work right. in, in the country itself, whether that be industrial, be aerial, be otherwise, and that cannot continue. And here, it is pretty important to stop that as well, because uh, I think there's a common understanding without any specifications here, at least at that juncture, that the Libyan army should be stronger, that the international boycott on its armament should stop because it has a national mission to upkeep 
Libyan life, Lib Libyan unity as it should be. Well, let me just ask you, I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I needed to ask you about this. The fact that the United Nations has yet to lift an arms embargo on Libya with a lot of um, perhaps a international concern, so to speak, about if they were to do so, that they're not sure where the arms uh, would end up or in whose hands they would end up. Do you think that that's a valid um, excuse? No, it's, it's quite invalid as a matter of fact. Mm. Uh, I think that at that time, on face value, the reason which was used was that, all right, there are factions fighting and they are warring against each other, and let us stop helping one against another. That's not the case now. Right. The Libyan army has been recognized by the parliament, which is the legal, internationally recognized organ and it is, I think, after Cairo, also recognized by al Sadraj group and his council. And three, it is not a vague recognition because that recognition has been tied up, as you know, with that the role of the army was to maintain Libyan and safeguard uh, its, its, its interests and stop militias from manipulating certain parts or introducing terror or being part and parcel themselves mm. of certain terrorist external groups or at the same time jeopardizing and destructing Libyan economic assets like the refineries, etc., etc. Right. Now, on not the very recent days, um, we have seen such functions being operated. Mm -hmm. The Libyan army has been successful in safeguarding the Libyan refineries on the Mediterranean. Right. And it has not taken the revenue, it has left the revenue to the government. Number two, it has been able to fight some factions which are well known to be terrorist factions in Benghazi and other parts of Libya. Three, they have proceeded in other parts of Libya according to what they can really do within their own limited or restricted force to operate. So that's being recognized and the parliament has recognized all of that. Now, your question, can this go on without these people being properly armed? I don't think so. Right. I don't think that sort of resolution will hold at those that sponsored it in the beginning, that they, they have really no logic here, right. other than maintaining the chaos, chaos, protecting the chaos, or protecting with the chaos their own interests. Well, let me ask you just a final question in, in a nutshell, Ambassador Nabil. Obviously, the international community's involvement, do you think that the international community, the United Nations, should be involved? There is this uh, a, a, an Arab affair or, or an affair for Libya's neighbors in particular to try and solve? We cannot really avoid that. It is, of course, Libyan to start with. Mm. And it is Arab, of course. It is among the files which we have now in, in the Arab world in spite of the points of weakness that are quite obvious in the Arab situation, regrettably. Right. And as a matter of fact, it has already been adopted by the international community. We have an envoy uh, which represents the Secretary General of the United Nations. Right. And we have resolutions which were issued from the Security Council in relation to that. I think the coming phase, hopefully, after the tripartite meeting, would uh, actually get the support within the Arab world per se, Arab mm. governments, so mm. to say, and certainly to give a strong push on the international arena to maintain the main pillars, Libyan unity, right. Libyan peace, and Libyan getting together and no terrorism. And there's a good chance if the Libyans themselves do give signs of success and accord in their coming dialogue. Right. Okay, I thank you very much, Ambassador Nabil Badr, former assistant foreign minister. It's always a pleasure having you here.
Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all the time we have for this edition of the Daily Debate. Do join us again tomorrow, same time, same place. Until then, it's goodbye from me. Thanks very much.